Commerce and specifically the AmCham Respond Project. And I would like to start this off by inviting my esteemed colleague, our executive director, uh, Eb Hinchcliffe, to deliver welcoming remarks. I don't know if Eb can hear me. Eb had some computer issues this morning, but I just saw him in our group. Uh, while we're waiting for Eb to come in, and he should interrupt me at any point, I'd like to say that we have a fantastic turnout for this, the seventh in a series of special legislative reform discussions that uh, our office at AmCham uh, has been organizing uh, over the last 12, uh, 12 months. Uh, I, I've got a note that Eb is back with us. Eb, can you hear me? Yes, I can, John. Great. Why don't you take it over for a minute with your Texas welcome, please? <laughs> well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to have you this afternoon joining us. I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, but uh, let's see how long I can last on this one. The uh, I am here in Makati, uh, so hopefully the internet's better than up, uh, up north, up south. Anyway, I'd like to say a big welcome to our panelists today. Really appreciate you taking time out of uh, your busy schedule to, to participate in this very, very important uh, event. And all of you participants, big thanks, of course, to John Forbes, my fellow JFC uh, friends and uh, uh, co-workers. Uh, appreciate all of them and the effort that goes into this. Aviation is just one of the many that we're working on, but I can't think of anything is, uh, more important than this uh, aviation. Uh, there are, just like to mention, there are a couple of, uh, actually there are three bills that are probably have gotten lost in the shuffle between uh, CREATE and uh, PSA and some of these other very important business bills. Uh, but first of all, we're advocating for this, uh, the uh, bill to pass as the uh, National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB. That would be a big help. Uh, then the next step after that would be the co-op, uh, Civil Aviation uh, Board creation and improvement. Right now, there's uh, some conflicts there about who manages the airports and who runs the safety and such on it. And then once that's done, then there's the third one with the Philippine Airport Authority. So those three bills, we hope they don't get lost in the shuffle. Uh, keep our congressmen and our, our government officials would keep their eyes on this one. Should be no controversy about any of them and should pass easily. But anyway, again, thanks everybody again for joining us. And uh, I hope to uh, see you again in person soon. MCHAM's office is uh, currently closed except for a very skeletal staff. will remain so until uh, either more vaccinations or the situation improves. But uh, we're in our very efficient we'll work from anywhere mode. My team's done a great job of keeping us busy. So if there's anything I can do or the chamber can do to support you, well, please let us know. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, John. Yeah, thanks, Ed. There's a lot, lot you can do for me. I'll let you know after this is over. <laughs> I knew that was coming. Thank you. Thanks, John. You knew that was coming. Okay. Um, so um, uh, let me welcome everybody again and thank Ed for that. Uh, I... Uh, by welcoming everybody, you know, it's impossible to actually recognize everybody. We have media, thank you for coming. We have uh, people from the House Representatives and the Congress and various uh, agencies. I even have a friend in Bangkok who had signed up uh, and we had 110 people sign up. We have uh, four different offices at the US Embassy, the Danish Embassy. Let me welcome you all this afternoon. We have an excellent program for you. We have the chairperson of the Committee on Transportation, uh, the Honorable uh, Edgar Sarmiento. Who good afternoon, has, John. Very much. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome to uh, welcome to this forum. And uh, thanks for inviting me. We're excited to hear the success that uh, you're having in in the house. Uh, I'm also going to ask you about your trip to Bogota, Colombia, which I just learned about yesterday. Um, if I was correct, when you went to see the bus rapid trans uh, transport right. system there. Uh, I don't know anybody who's gone to see that very first in the world, the exemplar. Um, uh, then uh, we have Professor uh, uh, Cherry Lynn Rodolfo, who was the author of our uh, uh, airport policy brief uh, in February of 20, uh, 2017. Um, and 
We have private sector experts and good friends, uh, uh, Sammy, uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Bobby, Bobby Lim, uh, former undersecretary, and Sammy David, uh, who I first met when he was the country rep for FedEx here. So uh, very, very good, and we'll wind up with a, a, a Q&A. Um, so I want to start with our speaker, who I didn't mention, but I'm just saving the best for last, who is going to give welcoming remarks from USAID, uh, Jeff uh, Goebel who just texted me that he lived in Bogota for seven years. Uh, so I guess he's probably used that, uh, that system a lot in uh, his daily work. Jeff, you've, you're almost a veteran now after almost a four or five <laughs> months here at, uh, at Post. Uh, yeah, and almost, yeah, five almost. months. And, yeah, and, you've been, and, and you've been <laughs> at one of our previous uh, uh, discussion series, so it's nice that you're joining us. Uh, again, um, uh, the Office of Economic Development and Governance uh, that you're uh, the chief of sort of sums up what the Philippines is working and striving to do, economic development, uh, more of it, and uh, uh, better, uh, better uh, governance. And you came to us uh, from uh, Islamabad, uh, from running a similar Office uh, of Economic Growth and Agriculture at USAID Pakistan. And... Uh, I understand after you got your master's degree in international development policy at Duke, what a wonderful campus, uh, uh, that you uh, joined, uh, joined USAID. And you've been in some really interesting places in addition to uh, Bogota. Um, uh, you've been in the South Sudan as one of those very fragile uh, uh, countries um, and uh, in, in Cairo as deputy office director of the Democracy and Governance Office. And uh, also uh, several years in Iraq, uh, we were working with the US military in the counterinsurgency efforts there. So you've had a lot of experience and in some ways with some of those posts, uh, Manila is an r, &R site. Uh, the Filipinos are the friendliest of all the people in the world. And uh, it's a great place to be. And we've enjoyed your early, uh, early time here and we hope you're gonna stay and, and have great impact. Uh, and you have the chance to transition between uh, two administrations. That, uh, that happens only once every six years. So welcome again, and we look forward to your remarks, Jeff. Yeah, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, yeah, I did spend uh, a while in Bogota, and I can neither confirm nor deny that I rode that system. Uh, we're not supposed to, but um, yeah, I'll just... Oh, you're not, <laughs> that's like, it's a great system, though. Them here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you, and, and I appreciate everybody joining us today. Magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. Yes, thank you for the uh, great introduction, and I really appreciate everybody joining us here today. It's quite a turnout. Uh, but let me first start off uh, before my remarks just to acknowledge some of our key partners. Uh, as I said before, none of what we could achieve is possible without uh, the help and contributions input, leadership, and vision from um, some of our key counterparts. And here I want to particularly uh, shout out to uh, both you all there at the American Chamber of Commerce, but then, of course, our Philippine government counterparts. I think that, that uh, uh, the nexus of your efforts really uh, pays off uh, over time on a number of issues, and this is, is but one of many. So let me um, first start off by thanking some specific individuals. Uh, the Honorable Congressman Edgar Mary Sar Sarmiento, the, the chairperson uh, for the Committee on Transportation. Um, also, uh, Mr. Samuel David, the country manager for International Air Transport Association. Uh, we have uh, Attorney Roberto Lim with us, the vice chairman and executive director for the Air Carriers Association of the Philippines. We also, thank you, Eb, you're here with us, the executive director for the American Chamber of Commerce. Here in the Philippines, uh, Mr. Jaime Faustino, the co-chair for AmCham Infrastructure and Logistics Committee. And finally, Dr. Maria Cherry Lynn Rodolfo, the lead convener for the Safe Travel uh, Alliance. So thank you all, and of course, everyone else that's joining us uh, from various locations. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Goble, and I represent the United States Agency for International Development, or commonly known as USAID. And USAID is the lead U.S. government agency for international development and humanitarian assistance. 
And so again, I'd like to welcome you all to this afternoon's forum on aviation reform. And this forum was organized by USAID and the UP Public Administration Foundation uh, through the Regulatory Reform Support Program for National Development Project, and also in partnership with the American Chamber of Commerce. And this forum brings us together, uh, the government representatives, uh, business leaders from across the region and around the world to discuss important pending legislation that seeks to introduce game-changing reforms in the aviation sector. And in the current Philippine development plan, the Philippine government aims for the provision of adequate, reliable, and safe access for people and goods. This mantra is elaborated further in the national transport policy, and this envisions people-oriented national transport system that is safe, secure, reliable, efficient, integrated, intermodal, affordable, cost-effective, environmentally sustainable, and ensures the improved quality of life. And this certainly represents quite a high bar, a lot of adjectives that are used there, uh, but it's a noble and worthwhile goal. And in parallel, in 2017, the Joint Foreign Chambers and the Philippine Business Groups, as convened by AmCham, published an aviation policy brief recommending three legislative reforms that you mentioned earlier. These included amendments to the Civil Aviation Authority Act of the Philippines, the creation of the National Transportation Safety Board, and then thirdly, the creation of the Philippine Airports Authority. And we're pleased that out of these three bills, the last two were included in the legislative agenda in the Philippine Development Plan midterm update of the National Economic Development Authority. And so at the heart of these reforms is improving the governance framework to modernize air transport systems. Uh, the goal is an improved, safe and secure and efficient air travel and tourism uh, sector in support of speedy recovery after the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, tourism accounted for more than a 10th of the country's GDP with more than 5.7 million workers in the industry. That's significant. And as recommended by experts, there is a need to deconflict the competing mandates of CAAP as it currently serves as regulator and safety oversight, as well as the operator and investigator. And to use an analogy, uh, which may be a bit imperfect, uh, here at USAID uh, missions here and around the world, we have an independent audit team that provides project oversight and performs audits but they are not allowed to implement their own projects. And so this separation of duties really provides an important system of checks and balances on our work. And so the proposed amendments to the Kaab law define the focus uh, of the agency on its oversight and regulatory function. And the development and operational functions of Kaab will then be transferred to a proposed Philippine Airports Authority, which represents an independent entity. On the other hand, the proposed creation of the National Transportation Safety Board would centralize the conduct of all impartial investigation on transportation related accidents and incidents. And so at present, different agencies handle different sectors of transport related accident investigations. So for example, the CAOP has authority over aviation disasters, whereas sea mis mishaps, uh, these are addressed under the Maritime Industry Authority. And so we at USA recognize the efforts of the Philippine government to build an enabling environment for Filipinos to maximize the economic potential of the country. And I think the passage of these three bills really represents an important component of broader efforts to return economic growth to pre-pandemic levels. And so this afternoon, I'm looking forward to the presentations on, on the aviation sector, as well as the three pending bills in Congress. So in closing, please let me again congratulate our friends from AmCham and the U.S. ASEAN Business Council and the UP Public Administration Foundation for collaborating with us in this forum. I look forward to a productive session this afternoon. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much.
All right, I'm back on. Salamat po, Jeff. Thanks very much. Thanks for uh, spending time with us this afternoon. And thanks for all the great work uh, you do at uh, USAID. And congratulations to your former country director who just served as the acting director of USAID in Washington. And now she can retire uh, down to Atlanta, Georgia and Samantha Power. We hope uh, Administrator Power will get to the Philippines when we get back to normal travel times in the future. Uh, yeah. If you can pass that message on to her in Washington, we'd appreciate it. We'll um, certainly do that, John. Yeah, thank you. So I've welcomed everybody, and, and uh, more people have come on since uh, we began a little while ago. And I want to get on to our first speaker, Twinkle, fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, I just wish to, uh, uh, to, to note this policy brief that we did publish, and a number of people with us today were there. Uh, because Dr. Rodolfo was, in fact, the principal author of that, and that policy brief was supported by USAID and also by uh, the Australian Embassy and the Asia Foundation, and both Sammy David and, uh, and, and, and attorney, attorney Lim and, and some others attending us uh, were there at the press conference when we launched it, and uh, we, we either have sent today or we will send later today to all of the participants a copy of the policy brief because we're extremely proud of it. That's a very, very good document. And uh, we have so many wonderful partnerships with other chambers and Philippine business organizations and with the Congress and the executive branch to accomplish the objectives uh, of that, uh, that policy brief, especially when we end the pandemic and we get back to the period of, of rapidly growing uh, travel, both domestically and uh, and international uh, tourism. Um, so uh, uh, that's a very important document, and uh, uh, to have the principal, uh, <clears throat> the principal speaker, uh, to follow here in a few minutes uh, with us today, uh, we are indeed honored. Uh, I would just like to again repeat because the legislation is uh, not in the headlines; it's not. Uh, yet in the uh, in the Lead Act 12, uh, but it's really important. And there's time before Congress finishes its, its work and turns to the campaign around February of next year. There are nine months left. Uh, there's time to get uh, get these three bills done. The first, the National Transportation Safety Board, has in fact passed the Senate. And and thank you, Chairman Sarmiento, because it's also now passed in, in your committee and ready to go out to the plenary, I believe, uh, in, in the House. Uh, and the uh, Airports Authority Bill uh, is likewise been approved uh, in the, uh, the House of Representatives. So a double thanks we have to uh, Chairperson Sarmiento. Uh, but we have to encourage our good friend, Senator Gordon, whose Committee on Government Corporations in the Senate as the bill pending there. And we've actually wrote uh, a letter to Senator Gordon. He's very busy with the Red Cross, but we will try to talk to his staff about getting a hearing schedule uh, in, the, in the Senate. And then finally, the bill on co-op, uh, which I think is the longest of the three bills, but a lot of it's te technical to update uh, various uh, provisions of the existing law, but it has uh, a major, major provision, which is to separate this conflict that you sort of have within co uh, of, of a regulator, an operator, and being responsible for safety. So the safety part, of course, goes out to the new transportation uh, safety board, but the operator part to operate and, and develop uh, uh, some of or most of the 85 uh, public uh, airports in the Philippines would go to a new Philippine airport authority. Uh, so I think I've said enough, and I'd now like to introduce our, our very good friend, uh, Twinkle Rodolfo, uh, uh, who um, is the author of our policy brief. She's also the lead convener of the Safe Travel Alliance, of which uh, AmCham and other foreign chambers are members. And uh, uh, she's been a professor, she's a consultant, and I know she doesn't like me to give you her entire curriculum vitae as much as I would like to, but I can say that she is the leading, one of the leading experts in aviation policy in the Philippines. 
and she's much involved in championing uh, uh, aviation policy reforms for over a decade, and we're honored and privileged to partner with Dr. Cherry Lynn Rodolfo Twinkle. Let me turn this over to you. Good afternoon, um, John. Good afternoon, um, Chairman Sarmiento, and good afternoon to um, all the panelists and also good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Um, I would like to start by introducing um, our alliance. It's a loosely based um, coalition of um, stakeholders across um, various modes of uh, transportation. And basically the objective is to promote um, safety standards in transportation and travel, recognizing that transportation is an intermediary for an end, which is the, the business of tourism, trade and um, mobility of the general public in um, overall. And next slide, please. Okay. Um, I think um, Sir Jeffrey has already um, articulated the critical role of um, aviation in the Philippine economy, but I just would like to highlight that um, our country is uh, somehow endowed with a network of um, 85 air airports across the archipelago based on the latest um, data of the CAAP. And there are, I believe, additional airports that are currently for development based on results of ongoing feasibility studies. And the contribution of this sector to the Philippine GDP is about um, 119 billion pesos in real terms based on the 2019 data from the Philippine Statistics Authority. Uh, directly, the contribution of aviation or air transport is about 0.61% of the, to the Philippine GDP, but IATA uh, took into account all the impacts, direct, indirect, and induced, and the estimate is about 3.4% contribution to the GDP. But I think I would like to highlight that since our, um, our because of our archipelagic, um, archipelagic nature of our um, of our um, country, um, aviation supports actually a very crucial industry, which is actually heavily impacted by the COVID-19, but recognized by Republic Act 95-1993 as an industry of national importance. The Philippine tourism industry, as mentioned, contributes 12.7% to the Philippine GDP and employs 5.7 million um, Filipinos. Now, aviation and all the communities that it supports contribute about 1.2 million in employment. Um, in the past uh, four years, uh, from the period 2016 to 2019, pre-COVID, the compounded annual growth rate of uh, Philippine tourism was double digit. It was actually considered to be one of the fastest in our, um, in our history. And uh, passenger traffic, uh, scheduled uh, traffic was a uh, total of 60 million, both for domestic and international, um, based on the date of the Civil Aeronautics Board. And um, very important for tourism is that 96% of international tourists arrive by air. So out of um, 8.3 million arrivals in 2019, that's about 8 million who entered the country. But the good news was that um, it was not concentrated in um, Naia, so other gateway airports um, were used for direct access by international tourists. So this included Cebu, um, Aklan, Clark, um, Bohol, and also um, Dabao. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Um, in terms of um, the role of aviation, I just would like to highlight what we call the three A's of uh, the air transport infrastructure development. And this includes the airlines, airports, and the air traffic management. And I think uh, it's very important to highlight that the development or upward movement of our overall air transport infrastructure depends significantly on the quality of our institutional and regulatory infrastructure. And aviation authorities actually perform a very crucial role. We have the CAB uh, doing the economic regulation. And in the case of the CAAP, it should be focusing on non-economic regulatory oversight or safety. Um, 
and to ensure that service providers and operators comply with regulations and pursue high safety and security levels and standards. Next slide, please. Okay, as mentioned, um, the national objectives are very clear and um, air transportation plays a crucial role being one of the modes of travel in the, in the country. And right now the CAAP performs uh, three functions and these functions include um, regulatory and oversight, um, investigation, operations and service provision. And uh, the major observation or the major challenges um, related to this um, multiple functions is that they have actually been a source of um, conflict of interest because we have an agency that regulates itself and investigates itself. Um, at the same time, the um, studies have shown that there has been weak, um, weak link between airport planning and budgeting and implementation as well. Now, given that we, have, uh, we are heavily impacted by COVID-19, um, under the recovery scenarios, um, such model where we have these conflicting functions may not really allow for an adequate uh, flexibility or adaptation in order to meet the changes in demand as a result of, um, of the pandemic. At the same time, the agility to respond actually can be constrained because of the, the compounded um, activities functions being performed under one single entity. So the recommendation is to provide linkages where they could be um, um, achieved in the form of convergence programs, which I think has happened in a way between transportation and, um, and tourism, and to decouple those that should be actually independent of each other. Next slide, please. So in terms of the scope of reforms, um, actually the proposal is to pursue what we call organizational delinking, meaning really separating completely these functions from the current CAAP, which means that you will have a CAAP that will focus only on regulation and safety oversight, and then a separate body, which is the Philippine Transportation Safety Board, focusing on investigation, and uh, the Philippine Airports Authority, plus the various independent airport authorities, focusing on operations and service provision. I just would like to mention that there is also another approach uh, that is used actually in various um, jurisdictions. And this is what we call the functional delinking, meaning creating or building firewalls um, between departments. Um, in an existing organization um, like CAAP. And to some extent, if you look at the organizational structure of um, CAAP, there is a firewall created. And I think that is also a result of the recommendations of the GCG because uh, CAAP is um, under the GCG in order to um, improve its governance structure. However, um, as um, experienced also in other um, jurisdictions, um, Functional delinking actually can be sustained if, let's say, an institution has a very strong history uh, and experience also in um, really promoting very strong um, institutional development. Now, um, there's no single approach to um, organizational delinking or separating these functions. And in fact, if we look at, um, it's uh, as mentioned in the, in the policy brief or the air transport policy brief, um, various organizations or um, jurisdictions have different types of um, setup. For example, you have economic regulation in Australia handled by a separate competition um, commission. And then in some cases, there are actually um, 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 jurisdictions where you have complete separation. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk about the Philippine Transportation Safety Board. Currently, um, we're waiting for the um, approval or uh, approval of the bill on second reading. And as mentioned, the Senate version has already been approved on third reading. So we are um, looking forward to having this uh, bill approved by both houses. And after more than two decades, or, uh, more than, yeah, after more than two decades, hopefully by the end of this year, 
we will already have um, this independent Philippine Transportation Safety Board. In Section 40 of the CAAP law or RA 9497, there is a provision that states okay. that or that provides actually the opening for the creation of the Philippine Transportation Safety Board. Right now, there is an ad hoc, which is the Aircraft Investigation Inquiry Board that handles the investigation functions within CAAP. Now, under this PTSB, there will be a single body that will now um, promote and nurture a culture of safety um, in our country, because I think that is um, a primary role of this transportation safety board. It is not just to investigate incidents or accidents, um, uh, particularly major ones, but most importantly, to promote safety standards across all modes of um, transportation. Next slide, please. So the main objective is to improve transportation safety measures and ensure implementation of this safety standards. It's a non-regulatory and autonomous agency um, under the office of the president. And um, it's a primary agency to investigate transportation-related accidents and incidents on land, air, and sea. The idea is that uh, we promote the safety, not just you know, in the transportation sector, but most importantly, also, we protect the communities where these transportation modalities are actually located. For example, communities um, uh, near airports or seaports or uh, land transport terminals and, um, and even pipelines. So it's very important that the communities are very well protected. Next slide, please. Now, the next, um, um, the next, uh, the linking is what related to the CAAP law amendments. Next slide, please. So right now, um, we have a bill in Congress, and it's uh, the principal author is Chairman Sarmiento, who is with us today. Um, I won't discuss the details of, of the bill, but suffice it to say that this bill aims to grant CAAP with sufficient power and authority to resolve any deficiencies in the industry and to focus really on safety and regulatory oversight. Um, there's no counterpart bill yet in the Senate. And uh, we hope that um, there would be a counterpart bill uh, soon. And that when we have a stronger CAAP, we will have a more resilient rebound from this COVID-19 pandemic because uh, it will be able to concentrate really on core functions related to safety standards and oversight. Next slide, please. So with this um, CAAP law amendments or House Bill 8700, it will not only strengthen CAAP, but it is, is, is the second step in the separation of the conflicting functions of um, CAAP. Next slide, please. And then for the Philippine Airports Authority, we have House Bill 7976. The principal author is a representative Eric Olivares. It's already approved by the Joint House um, Government Enterprise and Transportation Committees. In the Senate, there's a Senate Bill ver count version 1490. The principal author is Senator Grace Poe. It's a waiting um, hearing, the first hearing for, for this bill. Next slide, please. So the main purpose of the um, House bill is to allow the airports authority to undertake all manner for business and development projects for the establishment of a reliable and more efficient air transport industry. Currently, there's a section in the, the uh, law in RA 9497 that um, uh, mandates or directs the CAAP to be heavily involved in um, development of airports, forecasting of traffic and um, operations and um, maintenance. With a network of about 85 airports across the country, I think this next two years gives us really a good time to um, step back and really um, think about how we can uh, transform our airport assets, some of which may have not been um, maximized or have not been fully um, harnessed based on a value proposition that actually it can um, it can have, most especially when linked with tourism and trade development in the area. So by creating this airport authority, we some, we actually would help delink uh, these um, functions of operations and maintenance 
away from CAAP. And CAAP will be able to concentrate on safety and regulatory oversight. Next slide, please. So I think, I think with that, I'd like to thank everyone. Uh, this is the overview of the ongoing reforms and then the details I think we can discuss um, during the open forum. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Twinkle, for the excellent overview of these three challenging pieces of legislation. Um, uh, next, uh, I would like to invite a very important uh, member from Congress, uh, our chairperson of the Transportation Committee, uh, Representative Edgar Mary Sarmiento. And excuse me if I get confused with the names of Sarmiento because his predecessor as chairman of the committee is also a Sarmiento, and your brother also earlier served in your seat at the first district uh, representative of, of, of Samar. Uh, so uh, welcome congressman, welcome chairperson. Uh, you're, you're filling in in a, uh, a distinguished line of Sarmientos, whether they're, uh, maybe the, uh, your colleague from Cotton was also part of your family, I don't know, but you're all uh, doing a very challenging uh, type of work in dealing with transportation because it's such a huge, huge field in so many different ways that affects every one of us in our daily lives. And uh, uh, as we all know, the World Economic Forum rates our transportation infrastructure as needing, needing improvement uh, is an understatement. Uh, so whether it's in policy or whether you're doing planning, I know you're interested in, in airport and railroad in, in particular, and we're going to invite you to be a guest, please. We're doing two webinars on railroad, uh, one on May 20th and another one uh, in, in June. Uh, and uh, I know that you're a civil engineer from, you graduated uh, in uh, uh, Cebu Institute of Technology, and that you have experience uh, in the private sector as well. Uh, as running your own construction company down in, do I pronounce it Cabo Longan? I have not been to your capital, I'm sorry to say. I've only been to Balangiga and Giwan in Southern Samar, but I promise you I'm going to get to Northern Samar uh, if I have to go to Mutnog and take the ferry across. <laughs> or, or you have a new airport. I think I just saw, was Secretary Tagadi down there recently opening up a new airport? I think. Well, he was Jan. He was he was he was just in uh, in my place. That's in Kalmai specific. All right. I hope to get down there, uh, and I want to thank you for taking on uh, these uh, important but not too sexy bills uh, that are really important, uh, particularly as we have this uh, uh, pandemic slowdown uh, to uh, to the future recovery. Uh, and the improvement of, of aviation sector governance in the Philippines. So I turn it over to you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me, John. Uh, pleasant afternoon, everyone. Uh, of course, to Mr. Jeffrey Goebel of uh, the Chief I think, Officer of Economic Development for USAID, the different officers, of course, of the American Chamber of Commerce, my, my fellow panelists. Good afternoon, everyone. I have to concur with what uh, Jeff uh, stated a while ago, that indeed the three bills or measures are very important and it's a priority as well of the House of Representatives. It was uh, clearly expounded to and manifested by Twinkle Rodolfo, which I concur as well on all his, her pronouncement. Uh, however, uh, before I do present, uh, what is uh, commonly stated is our GDP, John, and. Uh, uh, different members of the American Chamber and all of the, those present with us this afternoon. Just to be specific, the, the GDP, the, the figure that we are referring to is around 20 trillion pesos for 2019. That's uh, 13.6 trillion in Luzon, uh, 2.7 in the Visayas, and 3.2 in Mindanao, uh, 20 trillion. So whatever percentage that we are referring to, that's more or less 20 trillion pesos in circulation. Now, uh, John, this is very important. I have a presentation for you as well. In fact, as what you stated, uh, Matnog, 
this is my dream and aspiration, John, and to the different uh, uh, members of the and uh, officers of the American Chamber and those who are with us this afternoon. In fact, if only we can bridge, if we can build uh, two structures, and this is the bridge that will connect Matnog, the Northern Samar, that's an 18 kilometer bridge, and another one Southern related to Surigao. This is the cheapest access on the Eastern seaboard. We can connect Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. It should not only be a bridge, but with the bridge as a railway system as well. That should be the way to the future. Now allow me, I have some presentation before I, I of course, uh, focus on House Bill 8700. I have uh, just to elaborate on the number of airports we have in the country. Of course, uh, House Bill 8700, uh, this is an act strengthening the Civil Aviation Authority of the Philippines to amend our Repub uh, Civil Aviation Authority Act of 2008. Now we have a total airports of uh, 86. Uh, just for everyone to see now, we have 12 international airports. Uh, these are, of course, spread in the Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao. Five in Luzon and the rest, you can, it's clearly stipulated in the screen. We have 13 class one airports, 19 class two, and 42 community airports, a total of 86. Uh, I have to do my homework. Now, of course, the next slide is about the number of flying passengers. Forecasted, of course, uh, less pandemic. So said, no, this, uh, the aviation industry is one of the badliest in this industry, uh, not only in the Philippines, but globally. But I still do believe that after this pandemic, there's going to be a reborn. On 2019, the stats 60 million passengers. This is, of course, the combined number for international and domestic flyers. And there's a forecast of around 5% per annum. So, but uh, this is no longer the number. Without the pandemic, of course, this could have been the number. Uh, reason the relevance, we really need to strengthen uh, the regulatory framework of CAP, of course, the Philippine Transportation Safety Board and the Philippine uh, Transportation Authority. Next slide, please. Uh, this is, of course, the uh, CAB, uh, CAP 8700, which I filed. Next slide, please. I can, uh, you can see in the screen the structure that we want to amend. Uh, of course, this is a, a 2008 bill. First, of course, uh, uh, I just want you to note uh, the relevance of uh, the presentation, the current amendment and the, the reason why. The current, we have a director general whose term of office is only four years. So we want to change it to seven years. The reason why the term of office of the president in our country is six years. We wanted to make sure that there will be a transition from the existing uh, director general to the incoming director general so that this transition of office will really clearly be attained. And again, John and the members uh, and, uh, and those who are with us this afternoon, I am a believer that uh, we have to do things in roadmap. That's why I do file a bill, not only on the CAP, but a bill uh, to legislate our infrastructure and the transportation industry of our country. No matter who the president will become, who, who will be the next president, you just have to follow what is stated in the law so that there will be a continuity of the things we're doing so finally get out of the circle that you are in. A never ending problem. And this is, I think, the best way to do. The board members from seven, we want to make it nine to include tourism and defense. Of course, there are powers of the board. I will no longer elaborate. It was already clearly uh, elaborated and manifested by Twinkle. So these are the power of the boards. We want some of the powers of the board. We want to transfer to the director general. The net effect, of course, is to strengthen the authority of the director general, no longer as a policy, but directly the director general can act appropriately on issues at the ground. We're forecasting this, hopefully that in the next one year and a half, once everybody might be receiving their jobs or vaccines, maybe again, the country will be prepared for it. Next slide, please. Uh, they have, of course, uh, fiscal autonomy, uh, the salary of staff, and mind you, uh, we just have to compare notes. The reason why, again, sad to say that uh, 
our uh, those that are handling the aviation industry in the country sometimes are tempted to work abroad. Easily, they are receiving around fifteen hundred dollars uh, a month. Uh, these are, of course, the salary of the air traffic controllers. In Malaysia, you have twenty five hundred. Of course, Thailand. Uh, this is uh, five thousand, and Singapore eight thousand U.S. dollars. Uh, you, see, you can see the difference, and obviously the reason why they're transferring. Next slide, please. Uh, I have to discuss further as well the, the status of the Philippine Transportation Safety Board Act. Uh, it's now due for a second reading and a wall card uh, once uh, Congress will resume session for its third reading. Rest assured, I'll work closely with Twinkle to inform the American Chamber the status of, uh, of the bill. Next, uh, on, to include the Philippine Transportation Safety Board Act. Next slide, please. I have to discuss as well the status of the Philippine Airport Authority, uh, which I chaired the committee hearing as authored by Congressman Olivares. Uh, it passed through the committees as was, what was uh, stated again by Twinkle, and I'm hoping that we can pass this bill as well within this year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that's it from my uh, and John, and I'm hoping that uh, I can respond well on questions that might be raised on my representation. Thank you again, everyone, for inviting me. I, I thank the American Chamber, and I thank USAID, and I thank the different panelists for inviting me this afternoon. Well, thank you, Chairman Sarmiento. That's a great overview. And we thank you again for uh, prioritizing these bills in your committee and your colleagues. Um, I, I, I want to uh, briefly recognize uh, several people I didn't previously. Uh, <clears throat> Senator uh, Pimentel is, is watching this, so uh, please be aware we're briefing a, the distinguished uh, chairman of the, uh, uh, the Trade Committee and Foreign Relations Committee in, in the Senate, and uh, thank you, Senator, for your interest. Um, and also, I wanted to recognize uh, the chief of party of uh, UPAF respond that we work closely with, that is deputy, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Henry Vasilio and also Dr. Mario Lamberte. Um, now our next week, now, now we have two respondents to the two presentations of Dr. Rodolfo and, and, uh, uh, and Chairman uh, Sarmiento uh, by Sammy David and Bobby Lim. And frankly, I don't have the program in front of me. So who, do, who am I asking to respond first? Is it Sammy or is it Bobby? Either way, John, may I defer to, to, my, to my mentor, Bobby Lim, to take the floor before I will. All right, Bobby, is that okay with you? Anyway. <laughs> right. Let me, former Undersecretary Bobby Lim, who's one of the leading uh, legal experts in aviation in the Philippines. When I say former Undersecretary, that's when we worked most closely with him at the beginning of uh, this administration under Secretary uh, uh, Tugadi. Uh, but uh, Attorney Bobby has uh, uh, been in private uh, practice for most of his life. And uh, I, I, I want to ask you to tell us why you got into uh, aviation, uh, because you're currently the Vice Chairman and ED of the Air Carriers Association of the Philippines, ACAP and you were general counsel to Philippine Airlines, and, and you had the same job that uh, Sammy had at one point as head of uh, the country uh, office of the International Air Transport Association, um, not to mention your distinguished service as undersecretary of DOTR. Um, and the bio I have to read doesn't even tell me where you went to law school, Bobby, so you're gonna have to tell me that. Was it, was it blue or green or another color? No, no, I went to the University of the Philippines, uh, John. So that's where I took my law. Okay, great. And then I took my master's at, uh, uh, in London, where I focus on uh, maritime law and international trade law. Uh, had some side subjects on aviation law at the time. Uh, did my apprentice work in London uh dealing with transportation law in general no? and came back here and continued with my practice so 
that's one chapter in my professional life until I found myself on the client side, which is Philippine Airlines. And then the industry aspect, which is IATA, and finally government. So that's a good uh, 360 view of the industry. Yes. And, and you've never seen it so challenged as today, I'm sure. Uh, we hope that PAL and Cebu Pacific and uh, all, yes, but all the great doesn't... airlines of the world come out of this. Yes, yes. Well, uh, I'm sure there's always a silver lining to crisis, no? As they say in Asia, there are always opportunities when there are crises. You just need to survive it. That's the tricky part, no? So, Bobby, uh, how, how do you react to these bills and their importance? I recall we were in a press conference together about this in February of 2017. And uh, as far as I've, I've worked on reforms that take uh, 20 years, uh, such as the Philippine Competition Act, or such mm -hmm. as the fiscal incentives part of CRATE that the president just signed at, at the end of March. So yes. these these seem to be moving, right? The, 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 the yes, yes. Right, I mean, right bills and I, I think it, it's it's really great news. No, I mean, it is the uh, it is a product of accretion because so many people have really given their best thoughts and time and resources over the years uh, to produce what we have here right now. No? And I think under the leadership of Congressman Sarmiento, I think we are very, very near in uh, making this major legislative achievement for not just the aviation sector, but you know, as Mr. Goebel said, as a governance framework to unleash economic development. No? because really the regulatory aspect is a critical component for economic development. Uh, the inherent inefficiencies of having an agency uh, deal with regulation and operation at the same time, right? One agency regulating and then regulating itself as it operates the airport, I think creates a lot of inefficiencies and this is being addressed by these bills, no? Uh, there is the Philippine Airport Authority Act that seeks to uh, transfer all the operation, the planning and the maintenance uh, to a new agency. Uh, there have been many versions in the past uh, and it's, I think, a welcome thing. From the point of view of ACAP, we welcome that because we believe it will be more responsive to uh, this agency is expected to be more responsive because it can focus on what the airport needs and what the market wants. So there should be a, a more focused collaboration, coordination between the airlines and the airports, the prioritization of airports to be developed. Uh, there was the time when airports were being developed based on less market-driven uh, factors. No? Uh, there will always be that tension because the local community throughout the Philippines will have their own clamor for an airport because it is such a catalyst for attracting tourism, development, connectivity. But it has to be rationalized. No, I mean, the airlines have to fly where the market is. And if you build an airport where it is not viable for an airline, it, it simply won't work, no? Uh, the challenge, though, for the Philippine Airport Authority is that what airport remains to be transferred to the Philippine Airport Authority? The bigger ones, the profitable ones, are already part of the PPP, no? the main gateways like Davao, Cebu, Clark, uh, and the others that are forthcoming, that are, that are the subject of unsolicited proposals like Iloilo, Bacolod, Puerto Princesa, Cagayan de Oro. Bohol, these are major gateways. Uh, they are expected to be profitable airports. So what will remain with the Philippine Airport Authority are the smaller airports. So what is critical there is funding. Uh, the law as drafted assumes that there will be a surplus. Uh, I, I think some economic studies should be made to assure that when this agency is born, it has adequate funds 
to make it viable. So that's that's one reaction I have on on the bill. Uh, uh, and I think the other important thing is maybe the Philippine Airport Authority will also regulate private airports. You know, that is an important uh, um, phenomenon that is happening. We, we have very important private airports that's helping tourism. But there are also private airports still need to be regulated properly, you know, in terms of the rates and fees that they, that they are charging. No? The, the principle of cost recovery should be followed by these private airports. Um, in so far as the other bill, House Bill 8700, which is the amendments, again, we, we welcome this uh, development, no? Uh, uh, it's, it's, we know that CAAP is really vital no? to make sure that we are in close adherence to the standards set forth by ICAO uh, in the past decade the past two decades, the Philippines has found itself in category two and had to exit in a difficult way. So we just need to make sure that we adhere to it. Uh, having the NTSB is one initiative that will satisfy the IKO. I think that's a, it's a major observation, the National Transport Safety Board. Uh, maybe we should, I should like to mention that in section one of this House Bill 8700, it says as an amended declaration of policy that the authority shall coordinate with other government agencies in advancing aviation security in the Philippines. You know, uh, well, obviously aviation sec security is very important. Uh, it can, in the spectrum of, of uh, the gravity of the threat, to national security, we can start with the, the simpler ones, not the terrorist type, not the hijacking type, but disruptive, unruly behavior inside the aircraft. That's a threat to aviation security. And we hope that a provision can be added to this bill dealing with that. No? Uh, there is already an international initiative to address this matter, which is the Montreal Protocol to amend the Tokyo Convention of 1963. Uh, but at this stage, instead of doing the treaty, we could already embed in, in this House Bill 8700 provisions that would give a mandatory jurisdiction to the Philippines if it is a intended state of destination by an aircraft, whether Philippine registered or not. Uh, that would make it clear that the offending party can be prosecuted because the history, not only in the Philippines, is that the unruly passenger is able to go scot-free, is not even penalized because of jurisdictional issues. Um, and finally, uh, I suppose the natural evolution of, of this, all of this governance initiative is to eventually have uh, the state consider the corporatization of uh, air traffic, no? which is again, another phenomenon that is happening in the world to create more efficiencies. Finally, on the National Transportation Safety Board, I, you know, uh, it, it, we're so close. Uh, again, we'd like to thank uh, Congressman Sarmiento for leading the way. We, and uh, we now have the House bill and the Senate bill. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's all set for uh, the plenary session. We, we only would like to, how would you say, um, reiterate our concern that uh, the National Transportation, Transportation Safety Board is a fact-finding body. Uh, it, it is not there to find fault or presume liability. The IKO model regulation states that. The National Transportation Safety Board of the US says that. Uh, the records of the investigation are not to be used as evidence to impute fault or liability, because that's not the purpose of the safety board. The purpose is to investigate facts so that it can prevent future accidents. And we hope that the House bill could uh, maybe hopefully clarify 
maybe in more explicit language that the report and the findings and the testimonies of the parties are privileged and may not be used as evidence uh, in civil cases or criminal cases. Uh, those are my uh, thoughts, feedback uh, to you know to these uh, major pieces of legislation that we expect to come uh, into fruition by by this year, hopefully. Thank you. John, thank you. I Bobby. Yes. Salamat po. Thank you. Thank you. I don't I don't know if the congressman wants to respond. John, I want to respond on the using Bobby's uh, uh, statement. Yes. Uh, first, uh, what he said, I take note of uh, everything, John, because I, I look at Bobby as someone that is a uh, resource person that can be trusted with the house. And I thank him and every engagement that we have. I always value his uh, time. Uh, again, on the, the, the Philippine uh, Transportation Safety Board, I take note of that this is clearly an investigation uh, not that cannot be used for claims or whatever, but to, to make sure that the recurring events in case of accident will not happen again. Uh, relevant to the, the Philippine Transport, uh, Airport Authority, uh, it is also defined in the different bills and the bills passed about the function uh, of uh, the existing authorities. It should not be uh, dissolved, rather be strengthened in close coordination with the Philippine Airports Authority. I, mean, I, I, must, uh, I am a believer as well, John, on the value of uh, public-private partnership to develop the different airports. But I am a believer as well as what uh, Yusek Babi said, it, it should be a market-driven entity. You cannot just build airport anywhere. Uh, nobody will fly. It's going to be useless. Now, finally, on the, the statement uh, on the amendment of 8700, I take note again on the, his input pertinent to the consideration of existing laws being practiced right now in the aviation industry that will strengthen again the House bill for the specific languages that will be used on the three House bills. And finally, I am hoping that this will become a law. And that's all uh, on my end, John. And again, thank you so much, Yusek Babilin, for your inputs. Thank you, Congressman. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Bobby. This, this seems like there's a sort of a mini hearing we have going on here. And, <laughs> but Bobby, I think we'll see, we'll see you in plenary, right? You'll be, <laughs> the, 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 the committee report is finished, I believe, so. Um, uh, Twinkle, do you want to comment on, on this discussion at all? Uh, and uh, later, John, later. Uh, maybe after, yeah, after uh, Mr. Sam David, we're doing the open forum. Thank you. All right, good. Well, thank you. Let me let me move on to my good friend Sammy David, uh, who I've known since his days with uh, FedEx. Um, but he's been in his present position since uh, since the time we uh, published this policy brief, coincidentally, February of 2017, uh, as a country manager for the Interna International Air Transport Association. Um, and, and, and I hope uh, Sam, will, uh, Sam will explain uh, more about exactly what IATA does, because not everybody attending today is uh, is familiar with the organization, but it's an extremely important one. It's private sector, not, not public sector in this case, and might distinguish it from ICAO that, again, people don't know so much about ICAO. Uh, but you have uh, uh, <clears throat> much work that you've been engaged in in driving the priorities of IATA uh, in the Philippines, in particular for safety, airport infrastructure, uh, uh, better uh, travel, and of course the uh, regulatory issues of uh, some of which we're discussing uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, but you've been in uh, uh, the airline and logistics and media industries uh, for, uh, we actually thought you retired at one point, Sammy, but you, you can't, you know, some, of, you know, some of us don't know how to retire and we keep on 
uh, serving uh, uh, serving the country in in a variety uh, of ways. Uh, and now, indeed, uh, you were also, I should note, the executive director of the Board of Airline Representatives as well. So let me turn this over to you, Sammy. It's great to have you with us again today. Thank you, John. And uh, I think you did today all in the head about IATA. So let me introduce uh, IATA in brief. But before that, just another comment that, you know, what uh, Bobby's comments were are strikingly similar to what I'm about to share with you. So I'm not sure if I'm uh, uh, making use for putting, putting uh, your time to use by, by repeating essentially what Bobby already stated, but just allow me to do so nonetheless. And uh, thank you also Chairman Sarmianta for, for, for all of these wonderful bills. Um, obviously, IATA supports them. Uh, we do have a few comments, uh, perhaps if you can uh, consider them. Um, well, IATA, or as, as John stated in a longer way, is the International Air Transport Association, or IATA. We are the global trade association for the world's airlines. About 290 um, uh, airlines are part of the IATA membership now. Um, within, within the Philippines, you will notice among the the Asia Pacific brands you see here, you'll have uh, airlines in Cebu Pacific standing as proud members of IATA. All up, uh, these 290 airlines represent about 82% of global commercial traffic. Our head office is in, in Montreal and uh, our new director general by the name of Willie Walsh sits in our executive office in Geneva. Our mission is really, it's, it's very, very apt uh, in these uh, challenging times, we work together to shape the future growth of a safe, secure, and sustainable air transport uh, industry that connects and enriches our world. Uh, to sum it up, we do support many areas of aviation activity and help formulate industry policy on, on critical aviation issues. I'll, I'd like to focus on, on the three bills at hand, um, starting off with a civil uh, okay, it's, it's buried somewhere here. Um, this is a House Bill 8700, or the Act to Strengthen the Civil Aviation Authority of the Philippines. If in case there are any cynics out there who, uh, who find it uh, challenging to understand the basis for, for the, the provisions in this bill, uh, at least the ones that matter the most to IATA, I'd like to share some points really that uh, show that these provisions are really anchored on global practices and, and guidelines, which the Philippines is a ratifying member state. Uh, and I refer to the ICAO recommendation that, number one, all signatory states separate air traffic control operations from aviation safety oversight and regulation within two years. Uh, and this was posted way back in 2004. So we, you know, there, there's, there's some catching up to do. Uh, number two, the same ICAO document also states that the requirements of the, by reference, the Chicago Convention will be met and the public interest served, best served by a clear separation of authority and responsibility between the state operating agency and the state regulatory authority. So there you see the world has spoken. Um, allow me just to focus a bit on charges. Uh, while House Bill 8700 um, uh, contains several provisions on, on compensation and how to basically keep the employment workforce excited uh, within CAAP, there are also uh, similar ICAO guidelines for policies and charges for, for airports and ANS. Uh, CAAP is uh, an operator, is an air navigational service provider also and therefore would fall within the Psycheo guidelines consisting of, of four, um, which are transparency, cost relatedness, consultation, non-discrimination. So these, these four guidelines speak, uh, speak volumes on, on how airport and ANS charges are to be established. And then allow me just to add on a fourth point. This is not in the bill, but perhaps can find its way somehow in maybe the implementing rules and regulations of what could be the new COP IRR. And that would be the development of a flexible use of airspace or FUA. The whole idea here is uh, enjoining civil and military um, aviation to cooperate, have a uh, series of formal data exchanges 
with the end goal of really sharing our limited space. As, uh, as you know, uh, within an archipelagic, archipelagic airframe, um, some portions of that space is reserved for military use and then others are reserved for commercial use or civil use. The idea of uh, FUA is growing. Um, it's uh, available in some parts of Europe. India has it where both military and civil authorities sit down and talk about how to utilize our limited airspace asset. That's it really for House Bill 8700. Um, I'd like to move on to House Bill 7976 or the act creating the Philippine Airports Authority. Now, it's uh, maybe I'll, I'll reserve this question later on about, you know, I, I'm still trying to figure in my, my mind how this uh, single Philippine Airports Authority will be reconciled with all the other airport authorities that uh, are currently in place in the Philippines and are actually also on bills filed at uh, the House of Representatives. Uh, that's, that's a question I, I would ask uh, uh, on this call. But uh, the, the I'd like to highlight here, as we think about a Philippine Airports Authority, again, perhaps maybe something that can find its way to implementing rules and regulations of this, this, this act, will be an airport master plan for the Philippines. Um, uh, currently, we seem to have a patchwork of what are private airports and government run and operated airports. And that's okay um, uh, as far as uh, how, to, how to implement improvements in air, existing airports. Are they going through, through uh, uh, unsolicited proposals as they are or where? I don't know where that stands right now. But the whole idea is as a country, as an authority, we could hopefully look forward to a, uh, an airport master plan for the entire Philippines. That, as was mentioned earlier, that's really based on demand, on what we call traffic forecast. Forecasts that run not just for five or even 10 years, they run the whole spectrum all the way to at least the next 25 years. The second point is on, uh, again, I repeat this, uh, this is also very relevant in this, uh, in this, in this act, in this, in this House Bill 7976. Again, are the ICAO guidelines on, on charges and fees for airports. Again, on transparency, cost relatedness, consultation, and uh, the non-discriminatory application of these, of these charges and fees. And what's not also in this, in this bill and was mentioned uh, by, by Twinkle earlier, by Bobby, um, is the whole idea of having an independent economic regulator for airports. We have, uh, we have regulators for several areas uh, outside of, of commercial aviation. And even within, we have the CAB that handles the economic aspect of, uh, of airlines and passengers. We have CAF for the, the, as regulator for safety. Now, what seems to be missing is who is the regulator for airports? As IATA, we support a, a strong, robust, independent and effective economic regulator. Regulation is required to protect users against providers' uh, potential abuse of their dominant position. Airports are, are a not natural monopoly. Um, you can't have too many airports in one, one place, in one region. Usually it's, it's limited down to one, creating that natural monopoly. Um, there has to be uh, an independent economic regulator within arm's length, outside of arm's length rather, to, to govern the economic aspects of, of airports. Uh, this would be my last slide. Uh, there's nothing much I could say about the National Transport Safety Board Act, other than pointing out that this is something that we are grateful is, is approaching its final stage of approval. We, we push that uh, we, this, this, be, this be enacted with, with urgency. I take the point of uh, Bobby and confirmed by Chairman Sarmiento again about hopefully more wording on the inadmissibility of evidence. After all, the NTSB's sole solitary purpose is really to improve aviation safety. Just uh, closing again, um, Bobby mentioned this. This is uh, the Montreal Protocol of 2014. It's, it's the whole idea of 
of strengthening powers of jurisdiction. Unruly passengers in on board aircraft, as you know, have been increasing. I saw this on CNN last night, and this is not the first time this month when I see this televised. Um, and it's sometimes it's even happening as uh, under our radar, but reported within civil aviation. Our statistics back in 2017 show that one out of every, a little over 1,000, about 1,053 flights globally uh, have, uh, have an act that can be considered as unruly passenger behavior, whether there's a drunken passenger on board or a passenger who actually threatens the very safety of the flight of their co-passengers and the entire aircraft. Based on statistics collected by IATA, this has not gotten any, be gotten any better. I imagine the, the events uh, unfolding as a result of this, this pandemic where passengers are forced to, 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 to don their masks and you have other passengers who question that, that, that enforcement, that could create some tension. And uh, uh, Bobby talked about the Tokyo Convention of 1963. That's precisely where the gap is because the main issue is that the state where the aircraft is registered is registered has jurisdiction over offenses committed on board. So if you have a flight, uh, it's a non-Philippine registered aircraft coming in from Japan to Manila um, by international law, the Philippine government will not have jurisdiction over unruly passenger events taking place on that flight. Uh, Tokyo Convention will, will clarify that it is the country of registration. So it may not even be Japan that might have jurisdiction. It's where the aircraft is actually registered. In this world where you have over 50% of aircraft leased by airlines, it creates a lot more confusion. You'll never, you know, it's, it's, it's not where the airline operates out of that may have jurisdiction because the aircraft is leased. So this causes issues when the aircraft is away from its country of registration. So the purpose is really to extend jurisdiction over offenses to the state of intended landing in addition to the state of aircraft registration. This gives likely COP and our police force more power to prosecute unruly passenger behavior. Um, our, statistics, our statistics also show that currently about 60% of unruly behavior goes unfiled, again, because of the limits of what the, the Tokyo Convention provide. Um, MP14 was, was uh, passed and put put on service uh, in 2020, uh, how the Philippines will ratify through an act of law or something that can be clarified by the, by the executive branch as actually something that we can actually ratify already with ICAO, uh, that, that remains to be seen. Well, thank you. I, uh, I hope uh, I was able to contribute to uh, some points of this, to this very scintillating conversation. Thank you. Uh, back to you. Thank you. Uh, hey, thank you, Sam. Hi, John. I think we we now um, can hold the open forum. Uh, we can indeed, and I think that we've had a great conversation all afternoon. Uh, there are uh, Twinkle. Do you have access to the Q's and A's? There are a number that maybe we should give priority to that people have been writing. Um, uh, have you, can you see these, Nicole? Um, yes, uh, would you like me to read the questions of an anonymous attendee? So okay. this one is the, yeah, this one is directed to um, Chairman Sarmiento. There, there's um, one, yeah, there are two of them. Good. Yeah, why don't you why yes. do that, please? Okay, um, I'll read the second one. There's no counterpart bill yet in the Senate for the CAAP bill. Would it be possible for you to find a champion for this bill in the Senate? Chairman Sarmiento. Yeah, I prepared, uh, in my opening statement, I prepared the speech, which I could have appealed in public to Senator Poe as my counterpart in the Senate, being the chairperson of public service. I think She's willing to do so. Rest assured that uh, that I'll, uh, I'll 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 do my own share to uh, on the counterpart, of course, and maybe uh, Senator Pimentel is with us as well this afternoon. 
who knows, he will be interested to file the counterpart on CAAP. And it's a very important piece of legislation. And I thank again, uh, Twinkle, uh, Samuel, for the very important inputs that uh, you, you stated a while ago. In fact, uh, the, the different members of the staff of the of uh, the Committee on Transportation is listening. We take uh, uh, note already of everything that you said to include, of, of course, uh, Yusek Babulim. So again, uh, rest assured that there's going to be a counterpart, Winko. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Sarmiento, for that response. Um, yes, John, would you like to ask the other questions in the, in the Q&A box? Uh, there's a question from an anonymous attendee who asked whether there should be strong qualifications for key positions in the CAAP, uh, such as director general, rather than just an appointee of the president. Uh, could I ask that of, uh, of the chairperson and the opinion of uh, our two responders as well? Uh, clearly, John, on the Republic Act 9497, there are specific requirements, qualifications stated therein. That's why uh, I'm hoping that executives clearly will have to look at the law on the qualification of the different executives that they want. So this is something, it's an issue, but uh, really, uh, John, uh, Simon, everybody, it's, it's in the law. Uh, the qualifications in the law. Anything the, the Congress... Uh, the legislative branch of government does, there are qualifications much more in offices, the criteria, and who has to take the seat, because it's very important. This is the Republic of the Philippines. It has to be handled by com uh, competent uh, members of the executive. We want to move forward, Jan. That's why I said, I'm hoping that uh, the that, that two very ambitious bills over and above the bills relevant to aviation industry, this is uh, the legislation for the continuity, continuity of the infrastructure, of the country and the transportation of the country so that whoever sits as a, a chief executive of the land, all you have to follow is the roadmap that we want to present to move this country forward. I don't want something that on the next six years, there's going to be another set of different criteria in terms of uh, uh, priorities because once we want, we want to move forward, we have to acknowledge the accomplishment of the current administration and whoever sits in as a new administration, there should be a continuity of all these things. That is something we want to change, John. It's like there should be a transition from the current administration to the succeeding administration. That's why we wanted to make sure that the, that the director general will have seven years or 10 years so that there will be a transition and the next DG, there will be a transition in his office to the incoming director general. Like in my case, uh, as was, you stated a while ago, John, I'm so happy that I was the vice chairperson during the 17th Congress. It was, it was Assessor Sarmiento of Catanduanes, who was the chairperson. I was, and he taught me so much. I have to thank the guy. And there's, there's, if you notice, there's a continuity as well in the Committee on Transportation of the House of Representatives. Well, as you can imagine, Mr. Chair, that's music to the ears of business chambers. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, the reputation sometimes at different levels of the Philippine government for incoming uh, uh, elected officials to want to change what the president said is not, not a good thing to do. They can evaluate and maybe some things have to be changed, but be very, very careful because continuity is, is critically important. Uh, so you, you said it, John, it's, it's continuity. Yeah, you know, it, True enough, there are different issues, but at the end of the day, this is the Republic of the Philippines, and we want to move out to the circle of problems that we have since day one of our lives. Move forward, Philippines, Mabuhay and Filipinas, that should be the thing that we have to do. Considering pandemic, and know that there's going to be a reborn of economic activities in the country, and I'm hoping that, I don't want to say, but it's very important. Uh, move this country forward. That's the most important thing. Well, we have a consensus on that. Um, there, there's a question here is not entirely germane, but I want to throw it out that uh, because we have experts here, uh, Bruce Rodriguez is asking, while the local airlines, uh, and we know who they are, are struggling during this pandemic, as, uh, uh, is there any proposed measures that will breathe life into the carriers and make sure they can make it through 
uh, this slump. I don't know if anybody would like to comment on this. I know that there have been some hearings on it and there are three Bayanians, including the new one coming from the house, Sammy. Yeah, you know, thanks, thanks, John. Now, before I answer that question, I just wanted to echo Congressman Sarmiento's uh, response to the earlier question. And if I, if I can add on just one more point, but it cannot, I probably cannot be cast in stone through a law, but you know, that person has to have, it. that person has to understand that this industry is on its knees has been on its knees since the pandemic began. We shut down aviation back in February, March timeframe overnight. It takes a while to restart that. And take, I take it back to the point uh, to your next question, John, about you know, what is being done. Uh, I can only speak from the private sector. We are, we are, we have fallen on, on, on government to, to work together towards a, a roadmap to restart international and domestic aviation. Much as it sounds like this is not the time for that, but we have to start talking about the time when aviation will restart, when we can once again lower our borders. Um, it, it took just one, one night to shut down aviation. It does not take the same amount of time to restart it. It takes a while. And COP knows that, the recertifications, the trainings, pulling airports out from the desert, that takes a while. We do need to have a roadmap to restart this industry. And a lot is on the line here. We, uh, Twinkle talked about 1.3 million jobs. We talk about $13 billion in gross value added. Our $11 of inbound tourism revenues are just all about dried up. I think it is an imperative that this industry um, has to lay the groundwork to restart uh, international and domestic aviation. We certainly- Janet. Support that, Janet, Jan, Chair. Jan, I thank again, Sami. It's a very important. This is something novel, something you never saw before. That's why it's collective effort of both government, the private sector is very important. I'm hoping that leadership, of course, uh, Secretary together, everything. Uh, once we have the opportunity again, there should be a roadmap on how to address much more the aviation industry. It's in bad shape, I know. I, if only I can, I don't, I don't have the magic wand even. It's, we don't have it. So I, 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 clearly, uh, I am with you guys. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, we can see this opportunity, but rest assured, while I'm still a chairman, that I'm gonna invite you guys to the brightest minds in the aviation industry coming from the private sector. It's not only government, mind you. Uh, all the stakeholders should be part of this. Come up with a good roadmap, once we have that opportunity, so you, you, you'll have my assurance. And uh, uh, everyone, you have my assurance while I'm still the chairman of the Committee on Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Franco, we're running a little over time. I think there, there's one question from Frankie Villanueva that can be answered offline. Uh, um, but, yes, yes. Uh, it's but, about the history of the um, yeah. uh, Civil Aviation Corporation. I mean, I think um, you might have. Can you answer it now, or shall we research it and get back to Frankie? Yeah, we, I think we can answer that um, offline. And then um, we have actually a um, question from Senator Pimentel. Uh, actually, he wrote a comment in the chat box. I joined the point raised by one of the speakers who regulates our airports. Who would like may to I, respond I, to that? Yes, uh, Chairman. Uh, that, 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 was, that was an issue raised by Sami. I really wanted to know, uh, out of the box, um, uh, who do you think should be the regulator in airports? Uh, and, and you clearly, you have CAB, CAB. But on the business side, who's going to regulate? This is something that I want to hear from you. Maybe you can respond to it now, but however. Uh, uh, rest, again, the, the staff of the Committee on Transportation is listening, and this is one thing I, I, I want to respond as well, but I have to really uh, yes. digest and who should be the best to regulate the airport, come up with a good number, because we want to encourage flyers once I said that should be part of our roadmap as well, present this, present this to the Department of Transportation. It should be part, really, uh, on the yeah. three house bills, clearly defining who should be the regulator as well. And I yeah, thank Senator Pimentel, uh, a good friend as well. 
the uh, maybe I'll just just a few thoughts, and I'll maybe hope pass it on to to Bobby, who might have some thoughts in this zone. Uh, the the easy answer, low hanging fruit, could could be the CAB uh, that currently regulates economic aspect of of uh, uh, freight forwarders, passengers, and airlines, whether they are in a position to take on airports. That's that that's something that could be studied a little more. And you also have I don't know the 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 Philippine Competition Authority that mm -hmm. might. Uh, 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 weigh in on this also, or maybe putting up an, a, uh, a separate independent regulatory agency altogether, uh, similar to what, what exists, I think, in, the, in there, there's the marina, and then you have for, for the utilities, you have, you have for, for, for electricity, you have for water. So I think we have a, a wealth of, uh, of structures in place already. It's only a matter of finding the right one and, and whether we have to start from, you know, Putting up a, a separate authority, or maybe having an existing uh, uh, institution take this on. This, yes. Uh, um, Sam, um, you mentioned CAB, uh, but I think this is also a good opportunity to mention that the CAB is still governed by a very old law. Right, so RA seven seven six. So if they are to be, for example, if they will evolve into into um, an entity that will also handle, let's say, economic regulation of airports, I think it's time to also um, review or revisit that mandate of the CAB. Uh, Twinkle, there is a question from Renee Santiago. Uh, and it's directed to uh, Sam. Sam, um, yeah. And uh, actually, I'm much involved in the PSA, so I can. <laughs> we're talking about natural monopolies in the PSA right now, and we're not talking about uh, in the Senate at least about airports being a natural monopoly. So, Sam, the question is from Rene Santiago, uh, one of our most knowledgeable transportation experts. If an airport is a natural monopoly, should there be multiple airports in greater capital region? Well, there are probably different reasons why different cities have airport systems set up that way. Uh, City of London has five, at least five airports, a couple of more military run airports. Obviously Singapore has just one uh, and then a small private military airport. But, but I think it's more a function of the strength of the economic regulator that will, will drive, the, drive, uh, drive the landscape for, for airports. Uh, it's probably not going to be necessary to have multiple airports if only to break monopolies. Uh, I think uh, the strength of an economic regulator should, should suffice. And I, I again echo Sherry's uh, twink Twinkle's comments um, just, just a thought. You know, while the CAB could be a candidate, we'd like a situation where that economic regulator is far enough, really, from from influence. As I think the board of directors stands right now, it's uh, heavily populated by by Department of Transportation, uh, CAP, and MIAA. So we'd we'd like to debunk the the thought that you have the operator influencing the regulator. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to be thorough here because we have questions in chat and questions also in uh, in the question and and there was one question about somebody favored the your version of the. Uh, Ka up bill, uh, Chairman Edgar. And the question was uh, whether or not the Senate, no, was it that bill or the, I, I'm, I'm having trouble finding it. Uh, PTSB, uh, possible for you to request the Senate to concur in the House version instead of having a bicam. Uh, we as stakeholders, although he doesn't say who he is, it's anonymous, support the House version and can make and can also make the same request to Senator Pope. Uh, 
it's, uh, it's a critical branch of government. Uh, I mean, it's a, a counterpart in the Senate. Uh, we cannot dictate on them. Uh, I'm so sorry. But I can appeal, uh, rather, uh, just have the, the version of the Senate uh, and the version of the House. Once uh, more or less everything is the same, I believe that the wisdom of our senators, we just, we just, we don't need to go to the bicam. Uh, again, I appeal as well to the, the, the wisdom of the, those that uh, are very good, uh, like, of course, uh, Isaac, Bob, and Sam, to intervene, of course, Twinkle, uh, to make the, the represent version that you think is appropriate so that we can right away move forward, move forward and have the, the two versions uh, pass in the different houses, then finally it will be signed into a law the soonest time possible. I, I think people think bicams are long and tedious, but that's they can be very fast. And I've even heard you do a paper bicam. And I particularly in these days of Zoom, I'm sure. That's <laughs> right. That's uh -oh. right, John. And there's, there's nothing is impossible. Of course, uh, again, these are wisdom peop uh, people. These are senators of the land. They think that there's there's no need of bicam. Everything can be resolved just by Zoom. I believe so. We will just approve of it. Uh, as long as uh, that there's no contesting uh, version of the different house bills. The only other question we haven't answered, and I think I can, is a question of whether or not it's possible for one company to have two airports in the greater Manila region. And I think, and I think the answer is the PCA would not allow it. The PCC would not allow it. Would, would, would others agree? Sam or, or Bobby or Mr. Chair. Um, at, the, at the moment, we have one operating airport for the greater Manila and, and two, one, one that is moving ahead that has its uh, fiscal incentives approved by, uh, by the Congress. And uh, there is a law for that now. And uh, then a, another proposal by uh, a province Right, it's it's actually a province that's proposing an airport in Manila Bay. So, uh, I I know the oh. remember the position Twinkle that we took in our policy paper was multiple airports. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. If 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 I may, the 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 the, the worry that he, the worry here about a single operator for multiple airports is the risk of what are called cross subsidies. Where you know one airport will subsidize the, the operations of another somewhat underperforming airport, so so passengers operating out of that profitable airport will will end up subsidizing the other airport. So the the idea of, of cross cross subsidizing uh, needs to be addressed. All right. Yeah, and um, John. Sorry, um, we don't have DOTR, I think, um, represented right now in this um, meeting. Uh, but I think it would be good to mention uh, maybe if um, the chair, Chairman Sarmiento or um, Sir David or Attorney Lim would have um, some knowledge about the, you know, the level of support of DOTR about the, the bills. That's a very good uh, in, 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 uh, John, I can respond to the question of Twinkle. Uh, clearly, there was an assurance by the Department of Transportation. They are very much supportive of the bill uh, in our committee hearings. In fact, they are pushing for, they are, they are excited as well for the bill to become a law. So I uh, think that will uh, answer, I believe, your question. And then there's a total assurance that the Department of Transportation is on board. Uh, together, of course, with Secretary, the leadership of Secretary Artugade. Thank you, Chairman Sarmiento. Um, I, I might add, add to that that I think it would be helpful if the LEDAC, uh, I know if the, if the bills go into the economic development cluster, I, d I don't know if it's currently the case, but in the last administration, you couldn't have more than 15 per cluster. And, and you might have some clusters that have relatively few bills, and then you have a lot of these economic reform bills that wind up in one cluster, but certainly if, if this could be included in LEDAC, I'm sure it would help uh, the, the progress of the bills. 
Um, and I can say before I ask for final comments, uh, is Jaime still available? Jaime Faustino, who co-chairs our infrastructure committee at AmCham. Uh, we haven't run over time. Hi, John. Good. I just wanted to precede your final remarks that that those of us working on this and the 16 organizations that signed the policy brief uh, back in February of 2017 are committed to advocate uh, all three of these legislations uh, all the way to the president's desk uh, before the uh, uh, <clears throat> for 10 months from now. Uh, and if necessary, I suppose in June, there's that little window even there uh, after the elections. And we want right. to thank, and Jaime, you'll thank everybody for all the wonderful conversation we've had this afternoon, I'm sure. Yeah, thank you very much, John. Uh, Congressman Sarmiento, the rest of the panelists, uh, Sam, uh, Attorney uh, Bobby Lim, uh, Twinkle, and of course, uh, John, thanks on behalf of the American Chamber Committee. I'd like to uh, thank everybody for attending. We're delighted to hear about all the progress that we've made. And we're excited that the legislation looks like it's moving forward. So this is a historic opportunity. We hope that we'll mm -hmm. take advantage of the last few months of the administration to kind of get these, these three bills over the line. So thanks again, and we hope for uh, um, success. And we'll definitely are, we are definitely committed to uh, continuing our support. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Have a nice week. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Um,